have a very um, ill culture here, and that culture is the culture of white supremacy. This is a place where I could have been remembered for being dead and committing suicide. We're talking Paul Manafortism. He's the alpha gangster of the moment. Supporters and opponents of legalizing abortion in Argentina demonstrated outside Congress as senators prepared a vote on allowing the procedure in the first 14 weeks of pregnancy. The country currently permits abortion only if a woman's health is at risk or if she's been raped. If the Senate passes the law, Argentina would be the most populous country in Latin America to allow abortion. China slapped 25% tariffs on $16 billion worth of U.S. imports, including paper, coal, and cars. The latest hit for tat in President Trump's trade war comes in response to a 25% tax imposed Tuesday by the U.S., affecting $16 billion of Chinese goods. Saudi Arabia is retaliating after Canada's foreign minister called out the kingdom on Twitter for arresting women's rights activists. Riyadh will cancel flights to Toronto, scrap trade deals, transfer Saudi patients out of Canada's hospitals, and order Saudi university students to leave Canada within 30 days. Our people will not accept outsiders sticking their fingers in our ears. A prestigious Tokyo medical school admitted to limiting the number of enrolled women by manipulating its entrance exam results. An internal investigation found that Tokyo Medical University lowered women's scores from as early as 2006, aiming to ensure women only make up about 30% of students. My name is Nakaya I'm Walker. I'm the current mayor of the city of Charlottesville. Growing up in Charlottesville was pretty tough. Most people don't make it out. So the same kind of um, issues that poverty bring that you hear about in larger cities, we've dealt with for my entire life. A friend of mine, we had just left the church, and by the time we had um, got to my house for me to be dropped off, there were calls coming in saying that, you know, there were people with torches marching on campus. You, you, you The next day was completely devastating. I mean, it was, it was very fearful. This is my town. We did not want the motherfuckers here. Charlottesville, it wasn't an isolated incident. If you look at it in terms of American society, these things have been popping up. This is the Portland Police Bureau. But a little bit deeper than that, the organizers of that Summer of Hate and of the rallies were two UVA alum. And now we're at a point where we have to be honest about the people using their skills learned at a university in the center of our town to bring harm to our town. I ran as an independent because we're back to the individuals who have maintained power. So when you talk about the people who have been in power in Charlottesville, they have been members of the Democratic Party who have allowed um, some of the most devastating policies to affect local citizens. We have a very um, ill culture here, and that culture is the culture of white supremacy. I've seen it my entire life. Ask yourself, how is voting the same way you do time and time again on things such as development and housing truly impacting community colors in Charlottesville? If you have a leader calling you out on your racist behavior, please stop feeling threatened, violated, or whatever you feel by the mayor's perspective, communication and transparency. After the events of last August, the conversations definitely changed. Ms. Walker, I've heard you say, I want the people to be heard. I hope that includes me and you allow me <laughs> Excuse me, we... I hope you allow me to speak without interruption. <laughs> Are we going to do this every Can you two just words? Can just continue? Oh. I'd like to end with a quote from Thomas Jefferson. Can we let him finish? Yes, we have to. Because just like everyone else, we've just been having this conversation at every level, right? 
So did you understand the what we've been talking about for over a year now about First Amendment? Yeah, I don't care. Okay. So it's not about whether you care or not, but if we, we he has a right to speak. No. Yes. 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 You were out here milling with us before you got up there. I don't know why you're telling us to stop now. We were right there. So what I'm saying is that he is here. I'm not saying I want to listen to him or that you should have to listen to him. I'm just telling you where we are. The uncertainty of the upcoming weekend will be the next of major <laughs> frustration. There's no trust of our current police, our local police, our state police, the federal government. <laughs> uh, at no level of government do people trust the process. My hope is that we do this work of transforming the current state of the city so well that people will come and ask us how did we do that and that we may become a model for how true change happened in a country that has been struggling with the truth for almost 400 years. From the moment he took over the Department of Justice, Attorney General Jeff Sessions has done several things to fundamentally change the immigration system. But let's be clear, we have a goal. And the goal, and that goal is to end the lawlessness that now exists in our immigration system. And Sessions can use a heavy hand because the courts that issue deportation orders or grant legal status are not under an independent judiciary. They report to the executive branch. In just the last few months, Sessions has imposed quotas on immigration judges and personally decided on cases, setting precedent that makes it harder for judges to rule in favor of immigrants. But immigration judges are fighting back. Today, their union filed a grievance saying the DOJ is interfering with their ability to make life or death decisions. This all started with a judge in Philadelphia who says that he was taken off of a case because when he wasn't sure that a defendant was informed of a court date, he chose to pause the proceedings. Last month, the DOJ assigned the case to a different judge, who immediately ordered the immigrant deported to Guatemala. The union says that's a gross violation of the judge's independence. And it's saying that publicly, which is unusual for a group that typically handles disagreements behind closed doors. That's a sign that immigration judges are growing more and more unhappy with the way Sessions is running their courtrooms. Ashley Tabador, an immigration judge here in Los Angeles, spoke to us in her capacity as union president. Why is this case in Philadelphia the case that pushed you guys to file this grievance and to do so publicly? Because it is a direct interference and violation of a judge's independent decision-making authority. This is what it means to be a judge. A judge needs to be able to preside over proceedings from the beginning to the end and be free from external intervention, especially the agency, from coming in and removing a case just because they're not happy with the exercise of judgment that he is um, that he's exercising over the case. How is morale among immigration judges right now? Morale is the lowest it's been in a long time. The judges are under extreme pressure to produce and complete cases. Their dockets are being micromanaged. And obviously, this whole impending quotas and deadlines that they've been told they're going to be subjected to in just a couple of months on October 1st has really, really made a lot of judges anxious. What is the solution? How can the immigration courts be made more independent? Essentially, you remove the immigration court from the Department of Justice, remove it from the influence of the Attorney General, and allow it to be truly an independent court. When you do that, then the judges can exercise their independent decision-making authority without worrying about the Attorney General or the agency stepping in to take actions against them just because of the relationship that the department has with the Department of Homeland Security. It's really surreal being here today, I'm not gonna lie. So this is a place where I could have been remembered for being, being dead and committing suicide. Jeff Ditzenberger is a corn and soy farmer. His suicide attempt was 25 years ago. 
I kind of had a sense of peace that I was just like, you know what, I'm not going to have to deal with any of the bullshit anymore. I'm not going to have to be a disappointment to everybody. I'm not going to be a burden to everybody anymore. And then I went into this abandoned house and I lit it on fire. And then the next thing I know, for whatever reason, I was like, why am I in this building? Why is this on fire? What, what's going on? Jeff served time for arson and he got help. He still farms in the same small Wisconsin town, but he's something of a local celebrity now because of his story and what he's doing with it. In 2015, he started a support group to break what he says is a stigma around farmers talking about mental illness. Between what the prices are and, and some of the, the stress that goes along with just the daily grind, just, it kind of gets to a person after a while. You just wonder what you're doing wrong, why machinery is breaking down all the time, or you're not doing your job to the best of your ability. And when things don't go right, it's catastrophic. You just get to the point where you'd even start asking people to tell them, you know, I'm not having a really good day, things are not going good. And the problem was is that, you know, it was a, yeah, you know, suck it up, it'll be better tomorrow. Everything will be fine tomorrow, suck it up, buttercup. I hear that phrase a lot around here, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What does that mean exactly? <laughs> For me, it eventually meant a couple of shots of Jack in my coffee in the morning when I went to work, a um, couple of beers at, at lunch, um, get home and it was nothing to go through, you know, 12 pack of something or a bottle of something. Good mental health care can be hard to get in places like this. According to a Ball State University study published in July, 95% of rural mental health professionals said they can't meet the needs in their communities. And it was the same thing every time I called, well, we can get you in in a few weeks. Well, I don't, I can't wait a few weeks. I need to get in, I need to get in now. And that's been one of the things that, that I would like to see is I would like people to be able to talk to other people. Jeff isn't a therapist. He has no mental health training but he gets farmers together just to talk about their struggles. So what do you do to blow off steam? <laughs> <laughs> I drink. <laughs> just, just tell me a bit about like some of your toughest times that you've had. We had uh, illness in our cattle and then half of them died. Then I just cut out every other part of my life basically and just stayed there trying to figure out how to fix this problem until I couldn't go anymore. And I ended up in the hospital, you know, went through depression, anxiety, and I was talking about my dad. I was trying to figure out ways that I could take him out to get the insurance policy to cover. I mean, that's how bad it got. It was, it was bad. When you were going through, was it easy to talk about? Oh, no. I couldn't talk about anything then. You know, that's what's so crazy about it. Why is that? Why is it so hard to talk about it? Because we're so isolated where we're at we become so used to solving our own problems that to push them on somebody else almost seems like a cop-out. A lot of the problem is the people that can help you aren't close and they rarely know anything about the industry you're working in. I called the clinic, like you said. I mean, it took some time to get in and then it was like two quick appointments and it, well, you're, you're not that bad off, bud. Go ahead. Okay, well, great. I'm fitting to kill somebody right now, but thanks, Doc. That's how mad you were. Made myself a plot and decided I was gonna check out, but it didn't work out, so here I am. People learn about Jeff's work mostly by word of mouth, and farmers from across Wisconsin reach out to him, especially now, when the industry's in crisis and net farm income has tanked for five years straight. Come on. I do a lot of thinking when I'm doing chores, especially by myself when I have nobody else to talk to, and this industry's really messed up right now. Commodity prices are low for just about every crop you can think of. Brittany Olson is a dairy farmer. She lives 250 miles north of Jeff. She reached out to him during a recent panic attack. So just you alone with your cows, you started thinking like, what the hell am I doing? I had to take a break halfway through milking cows, and so that's when I reached out to Jeff and I said, hey, I'm having a panic attack right now. Can you talk me through this so I can recover and get back to functioning? And what did he say to you? How'd that work? How'd that phone call go? He basically said, it's gonna be okay. Just try to relax, try to breathe. Namaste. And did that work? It did, it did. The farm has been in her husband Sam's family for 116 years. Sam took it over in 2014 when milk prices were at their peak. Today, those prices are at a 10 year low. So 2,700 pounds of milk, just went off on that truck. Yep. How much did uh, you make? Yeah, right now it's 
probably less coming in than going out. There's cycles in every industry. There's ups and downs, and but this one is just grinding really long and really hard. I know a lot of people have taken a look at that and taken a look at the money they can get and just walked away from it. Like, do you, did the two of you ever talk about that or think about that? Yeah, you can think about it, but I have a strong connection to this. This is, you know, it's in my blood. Come on. Come on. Ah. People outside of farm country are starting to notice this crisis. In July, the Centers for Disease Control put out a study that found rural counties had the highest rates of suicide in the country. Several states have small programs, like hotlines and counseling vouchers, to help farmers feeling stress. But a lot of those programs are underfunded. It's possible the next federal farm bill may include new funding for farmers' mental health care. But none of it's real yet. For now, guys like Jeff are often all farmers have. So what do you tell other people who live a life like yours of how to avoid this? I want people to know that one, you're not alone. It's okay to be not okay. It's okay to tell people that you're not okay. Also to everybody else out there, if you're the one being asked, take that time, be that friend. You could save two lives in that process. A week before the preseason, I need a roster. And what we're going to do is give you another sheet for three more players. In case anything happens to your players, you know, I read that nothing new happened, you know, go to jail and stuff like that. But uh, you got extra players you can pull from. The people in this room are organizing one of Los Angeles's recreational softball leagues. But this one is different. Its players come from neighborhoods associated with the city's Crips gangs. I would like to say that, you know, I respect all y'all, man, you know, continuing to, this is our third year going in, um, 12 neighborhoods coming together for this season, man. That says a lot, homie. A lot of people don't understand what we're really trying to do with our softball game. It ain't about softball. It's about all of us coming together and to try to unite and be able to help us to reclaim our communities back together. You got bloods. Um, you got Crips, everybody know that's red and blue. And there's a, a perception out there that the biggest wars is between the Bloods and Crips. But actually, there's internal wars that's going on on both sides. So this is the 18th side of my street, the rough side of the neighborhood right here. Um, a lot of shootings, a lot of dope selling. Back in the days, we, we gave it a name, Death Row. There's a difference between being a gang member and a gang banger. I'm gonna always be a gang member, and a gang member is someone who's not actively out in the gang and in the streets. That's a gang banger. There is a big difference. But once I signed on, I knew it would always be for life. I will always be a Raymond Crip. I am now headed to get started with my day of work, which consists of newspaper deliveries. You hardly work it. The job that I am doing now is something that I didn't think I would ever be doing. I'm a person who has spent a lot of time in prison, and so employment for me is a very difficult thing. I wanted to play professional baseball. That was my goal. A few things got in the way. I am the assistant commissioner of the softball league comprised of Crip neighborhoods which formerly did not get along. It gave me a chance to uh, make up for the negative stuff that I uh, helped create in the community. I've been able to witness over the last year how this organization has been able to step in and eradicate some um, conflict Y'all winning today or what? Hell yeah. Right now, them young guys don't want to hear from us old dudes. When we speak to them, they misperceive it 
as us telling them what to do when we're all we're trying to do is give them the information so they don't have to make the mistakes that we did. But if we can get younger guys to buy into what we're doing, then we can get even younger guys to buy into what we're doing. I think, are you ready for this? Let's do this. Let's do this. <laughs> not, not before y'all do. Casanova's team, the famous Rays, for the Raymond Avenue Crips, is playing a squad called the Spody Gloves from the Roland Forties Crip neighborhood. This used to be so fierce, you know what I mean? All these gang members in one spot. You know, it used to be a time where this was not heard of, or if there were two different gangs in one place, it was gonna be a situation. Did I ever thought this could happen? No, not where I came from. But this is actually history, because it's never been done before. No team want to lose out here. Everybody want to have bragging rights, so every week is like a championship. Hey, I'm the winning run. I'm the winning run. Line it up! Line it up! Good game, Chris. Way to play that shit, Chris. The stakes are a lot higher than just pride. And while it feels like a different universe out on the field, the violence is real. In just the past few months, two of the league's neighborhood reps have been shot and killed. We can't continue to do what we're doing on these streets with violence and shootings and killings, and we may have differences about um, who's right, who's wrong. But when it comes down to the field, we settle this on the field, and we also learn how to settle things on the streets. I know very little about Paul Manning Ford, except that he's been on the news recently because he's on trial for tax evasion, bank fraud, lying about offshore bank accounts. He's the alpha gangster of the moment. He has taken a lavish luxury and gangster greed to the highest level. And I don't quite understand what his taste level was. We're talking Paul Manafortism. Show me some clothes. These clothes that have been photographed, put your part of the evidence and documentation, are not the clothes that one would aspire to. You know, some of the suits that have been shown could have been easily found at men's warehouse. $300,000 in suits? You never heard of that. People just don't spend that kind of money in their clothing. The man was addicted to these labels, Alan Couture and Bijan, and it was a way to get the money out of the offshore accounts and to dress himself. I mean, I never heard of Alan Couture until Paul Manafort. He has jackets lined in paisley brocade, hunting jackets to go grouse shooting, his bold plaids, scales of plaids. They're almost clown plaids. <laughs> Big labels, flashy. It's a throwback to the 80s. It's a throwback when people were into flash in the 80s, new money. But an ostrich baseball style jacket, where do you wear that when you're Paul Manafort? Where do you go? Do you go to lunch at the country club? Do you go to your um, Republican campaign strategy meeting in that on Saturday mornings? This python jacket, this shape is weird. Is it long sleeve? Is it to the wrist? It's just snake. It's just slithering, glossy snake. Maybe when you're uh, hobnobbing with the oligarchs of Russia on the weekends, you have to wear ostrich or python to impress them. I don't know. The House of Bijan is, is a legendary house because, you know, they dress President Obama, President Bush, President Clinton. You think Putin's suits come from Bijan? Maybe they do, who knows? Well, I just think that he went into Bijan and lost his mind. He was in, in those throes of legendary sartorial excellence. Sadly, it did not make the mark. But, uh, you know, he must have been thinking, I've got to buy the most expensive thing, wearable art. Why isn't a man collecting paintings? If you want to buy good clothes, you find them anywhere. You find them at Prada, you find them at Tom Ford, and you don't need to go to these Bijans and Alicatours for clothes. There was too much fuss about these clothes. And, you know, but I guess if you're rinsing your hair Grecian formula, to make it look like you don't have any gray hair, you would do this. It's kind of sad to be talking about this. I feel kind of 
a shame to be talking about this. If Tom Wolfe were alive today, he would be writing a novel about Paul Manafort. This is The Bonfire of the Vanities 2018.